this um, this book's kind of big, so I'm not positive how it's going to go. This is this is for um, like fourth and fifth grade. Mario and the Hole in the Sky, and How a Chemist Saved Our Planet. Written by Elizabeth Roosh, illustrated by Teresa Martinez. And look, I was talking to you about um, nonfiction. So this is 363.738, and that means that this, the information in here is factual. So Mario and the Hole in the Sky. Um, I'm going to move this around if I need to. So when we get to ready to be able to check books out again, this is at a 5.4 grade level, and the AR points is half a point so that usually means that there's not loads and loads of stuff that you have to remember and so remember how I talked to you about the inside of the book jacket so this says how did a boy from Mexico City become a Nobel P prize winning chemist who saved our planet so anytime you think that you're just a kid no you are not just a kid you have a brain and this kid had a brain, and he used it for something really special. So, it says, 8-year-old Mario wanted to learn all he could about chemistry. He examined everything, from rotten lettuce to toothpaste under a microscope. As an adult, Mario continued studying chemistry and discovered something scary. CFCs, I'm going to have to look to find out what that is, used in millions of refrigerators and spray cans were destroying the Earth's protect protective ozone layer. And without the ozone layer, deadly solar radiation would bombard our planet. And he had to warn the world quickly. So this is the true story of Mario Molina, the Mexican-American chemist who brought the world back from the brink of environmental catastrophe. Let's see what happens. Okay, blank page. Nothing going on. Mario and the hole in the sky and how, he, how a chemist saved our planet. And the dedication, you know, sometimes I don't read these, but I think that this is kind of important because it says it's dedicated for to all of those who choose science over silence and to all future scientists. So, I'm going to try to keep this centered in the camera, but I don't know if I can, so just listen. Mario Molina was born in Mexico City on March 19th, 1943. By the time he was six... The world was awash in amazing new products made from amazing new chemicals. Spray. Spray. Mother's, Mario's mother misted perfume onto her wrist. Squirt, squirt. Someone polished a window, you know, like with um, Windex. Spurt, spurt. A press of a button propelled cleaner onto a counter, paint onto a fence, and hair spray onto curls. So do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about like the spray cans. But there's stuff in the spray cans to make the spray go out. So, But one of the new chemicals used in millions of spray cans and refrigerators had a dangerous side that no one had yet discovered. Feliz cumpleaños, Mario. On Mario's eighth birthday, his friends gave him a microscope. Or his parents, I'm sorry. His parents gave him a microscope. Mario peered through the lens at a drop of water. Eh, boring, he thought. But then he began to wonder, what would happen if I looked at dirty water? So he's got a cake, and he's got all of his friends, and, oh, they're going to play pin the tail on the donkey. And so here's Mario, very interested you know, there's somebody else checking the pinata out to see, well, what's the deal? Do we have no candy or what? And then Mario, Mario could care less. He is looking at that um, microscope. So, Mario soaked some lettuce and let it rot. After a few days, the gooey brown green mess smelled awful. And Mario plugged his nose, sucked up a dropper of the filthy water, and dripped it onto a slide. He peered into the lens and he gasped. Incredible, all these amazing creatures in just 
one drop of water. Mario's and looked at salt. Mario studied everything he could under the microscope. Sparkling salt crystals, tomatoes, onions, chilies from salsa, even toothpaste. Mario, oh look, he's got the leg of a fly. Mario was itching to see more. Can I use the bathroom as a laboratory, he asked his parents. No one ever uses it. Dios mio, his mother groaned. Sounds messy. But they removed the toilet for him and installed some shelves. Don't blow anything up, his father warned. So I guess they had a spare bathroom. Some, some people don't have a spare bathroom. I don't have a spare bathroom, but they did. And so they've turned it into his little laboratory. <clears throat> clink, clink, hiss, whoosh. Bitter smelling smoke wafted from the, out from under the door of Mario's bathroom lab. What are you up to, Mario? Asked his Aunt Esther, who was a chemist. Look at this, Tia. He showed her what scorched detergent looked like on slide. And she smiled and she said, I think you need a few more things. And she brought him a Bunsen burner and chemicals not found in a kid's chemistry set. So he's still in his little bathroom, and here is his Tia, and she is giving him some stuff. <sighs> She's encouraging his um, curiosity about science. So Mario carefully mixed potions in his bathroom lab. Miraculously, miraculously, substances changed from black to yellow, from water-soluble to waterproof. He conducted more experiments with a chemistry teacher in boarding school in Switzerland. He burned chemicals over the flames of the Bunsen burners. Sparks flashed purple-pink, crimson-red, green-blue like fireworks. Is he having a good time or what? I think he is. So he is in the store and he's looking at all these things, which we'll talk about as soon as I get to the other page. And so it looks like by then, I think this is Mario, looks like by then he is either going to college or maybe, I don't think he's a teacher, but I'm not sure. Anyway, it says, to Mario, chemistry had a mysterious power, a power that was changing the world around him. Stories were full and new and improved products featuring remarkable new ingredients that promised to be cheaper, better, easier. But Mario knew that even chemicals that seemed harmless could react with things in the environment and become dangerous. As Mario continued his study of chemistry, a question nagged at him. Were these new chemicals really safe? And he's talking about hairspray and spray deodorant, shaving cream. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Soon after getting his PhD, um, and that is a doctorate degree, Soon after getting his PhD and beginning to work in the United States, Mario heard something that started him on a quest to find out. A scientist studying air samples found tiny amounts of chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, that's that word that we um, looked at earlier on, floating around in the air. And Mario knew CF CFCs were used in refrigerators, air conditioners, insulation, and fast food containers, and as a propellant in millions of spray cans. He and his colleague, F. Sherwood Rowland wondered. Well, once CFCs were sprayed into the air or leaked out at the dump, what happened to them? So they are really curious, like what, what, where does that stuff go? So Mario and Sherry set up a, I guess his name's Sherry, Mario and Sherry set up a bunch of experiments to find out. They mixed CFCs with water. Most chemical compounds dissolve in rain, but CFCs did not dissolve. 
they shone lights on CFCs. Some chemical compounds break down when light shines on them, but the CFCs didn't break down. They set up a contraption to mimic Earth's lower atmosphere where any surviving chemical compound usually decompose. But those CFCs, remember the chlorofluorocarbons, they still endured. In the upper atmosphere, a layer of ozone surrounds our planet. Like powerful sunscreen, the ozone layer filters out deadly radiation known as ultraviolet lights. What would happen if CFCs reached the ozone layer, Mario asked. To answer the question, Mario jab, er, grabbed the simplest tools of a chemist, a pencil and paper. He jotted down the ingredients that could be released if radiation broke down the CFCs. One is carbon, called C, fluorine, called F, chlorine, called CI. So here he wrote out his, um, he's, he's kind of thinking about, you know, the, the stuff that comes out of the refrigerator and then it floats and floats and then the solar radiation hits it and then chlorine breaks off and then, and he's talking about the Earth's atmosphere and then freed chlorine crashes into the ozone and then the ozone breaks up. Then he wrote down what would happen if those ingredients reacted with the oxygen, called O, in ozone. And Mario discovered something very scary. Chlorine floating around, freed by radiation, would break up the ozone. Remember, this is an eight-year-old kid who's fascinated. I mean, now, he, now he's kind of grown up, but he was young when he was thinking about it. So bent over his chemical equations, Mario felt a huge weight pressing on him. The problem was even worse. After the chlorine destroyed the ozone, the chlorine survived. It could float around and destroy more and more ozone, and just one atom of chlorine could knock out tens of thousands of molecules of ozone. Without ozone, deadly solar radiation would bombard the earth, killing all plant and animal life. Mario heard, hurried to Sherry's office. We have got a problem, he said, a serious problem, and we have to do something. Floating oxygen frees chlorine again, and then freed chlorine moves on to destroy more ozone. So he was explaining his whole, um, you know, what he found when, in his studies to his friend Sherry. His name must, maybe his name is, well, I don't know what his name is, it doesn't matter. Mario and Sherry faced a sea of TV and newspaper reporters. CFCs used in millions of products are destroying our ozone layer, they said. They tried to explain the chemistry behind it, but only a few news reports followed, and none captured the magnitude of the crisis. Mario tried again. He told Congress, you know, regular Congress, our Congress, that CFCs were destroying the ozone layer, and still no one took action. No one seemed to understand how serious the problem was. And Mario was just aghast. People believed it was just impossible that humankind could endanger the entire planet. The planet was big enough, it would just take care of itself, he says, but I knew that this wasn't true. And so here's where he's starting to, you know, have like a news conference so we can talk about it. Oh, Sherry's name is Sherwood, Sherwood Rowland. So here they are trying to explain it a load of rubbish. It's a science fiction tale. For more than 10 years, Mario continued to study the problem and warn people about the danger. If we keep using CFCs, he said, huge hunks of the ozone layer will thin or disappear. Skin cancer and eye disease would surge. Crops could fail. It could be a catastrophe. Chemical companies, newspapers, and even other scientists said horrible things about Mario. Someone even accused him of being a spy trying to cause chaos in America. But why in the world would I make this up, Mario thought. I'm a scientist. He never gave up, even though he read the paper and sometimes it said it was utter nonsense.
Then a British scientist took some measurements of the ozone in the atmosphere and he found something strange. There seemed to be a huge hole in the ozone over the Antarctic, a hole the size of the United States. People wondered how that could happen. How could we have so much impact on our atmosphere and so quickly? And so Mari, Mario and Sherry again tried to explain the chemistry. Still, people demanded more proof. Scientists launched an expedition to the Antarctica, counting chlorine and ozone from a high-flying plane. The results were clear and horrifying. Chlorine was definitely destroying the ozone. Finally, people believed the scientists. Something had to be done, but what? Leaders from countries all over the world flocked to Montreal, Canada to discuss the problem. Mario explained the science. He pleaded for nations to join together to stop the destruction of the ozone layer. The discussions were so slow and cumbersome, he says, I worried that they might not succeed. Representatives returned to their countries across the globe. Mario was returned to his home in the United States and waited. This was the Earth's first global issue, said Mario. There really was no example of the whole planet taking action on something like this before. I didn't know it would happen, or I didn't know what would happen. I beg your pardon. Then Mario heard the news. 28 countries, including the United States and Mexico, agreed to stop making CFCs. Soon, 46 countries agreed, and then more than 190 countries, nearly every country in the world agreed to the Montreal Protocol. It was thrilling and satisfying and very much a relief, says Mario. For a while, CFCs already floating around in the air conditioning to rise to the ozone layer. It continued to rise to the ozone layer, but Earth slowly makes ozone all the time. It is expected to heal completely by year 2070. Humans had created the first global environmental problem and they found a way to fix it. So here's where they were talking about it on TV. There's Mario. And so now he is so excited that 190 countries are paying attention. So now, when Mario visits from his hometown of Mexico City, where pollution clouds his view of a snow-capped volcano, he worries about another invisible problem, global warming. The burning of oil, coal, and gas is changing the world's climate at a terrifying pace. But Mario has hope for our planet. His work on the ozone layer has shown that nations together can solve global problems. We can work with all countries, all cultures, all people of the world. We can work together. It is possible. That kind of looks similar to um, his birthday party when we first opened the book, huh? Okay, so that was like the end of the story, but then this is an epilogue, which means it's something that's after the story. And this is the real Mario Molina, um, in, it looks like it was seven years ago, and it tells all about him. It says, um, he had won the Nobel Peace, or the Nobel Prize in, in Chemistry for their work on CFCs in the ozone layer, and Mario says, I was just stunned. I was so surprised, I couldn't believe it. Um, I slowly realized that winning the Nobel Prize and all the attention one gets could be put to good use. And so he donated $200,000 of his Nobel Prize money to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for a fellowship program for young scientists from developing countries. You never know which young, bright mind holds the solution to a serious problem we face in the world, and we need every one. So um, as soon as we can check out books and we can figure it out, this will be available to be checked out. Again, it's Mario in the Hole in the Sky. And I know that there is quite a few of you that are going to want to read this book. So you just tell your teachers and I'll get a list. And for now, so long. I'll talk to you later. Bye.